Once again, we are back at the place. This is the place for intellectual, spiritual, and biblical honesty. Biblical honesty, yeah. I, like I had that. a hard time saying biblical when I started looking at you. I mean, you're awesome. Okay, that's enough. You had that pick <laughs> driving from Kansas to Florida. Everyone was impressed. And they continue to be impressed, and I don't blame them, but that's just the drive. way that it is. It was a long drive. It was a long drive. Uh, but you put, that, you put that up there because I had the road rage hair. But, and... but I'm proud. I'm proud. <laughs> a road rage hair. That will work. Uh, hopefully we will get into some rage tonight in a positive way. We have Bob Graves. He's going to be having this awesome conversation with Greg Bray. Yeah. Wow. And it got a little tense, that is, back and forth, that is, in the cult of honesty. And they were really putting down some things that I think were meaningful. And so you and I get to moderate tonight, not a debate, but a discussion, a conversation that will go something like this. Now, the rules are, let's make up the rules. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, the rules are, um, their opening statement will be 25 seconds long and rebuttals last five seconds. <laughs> I, I think okay. that, that will keep people from getting into monologue. And once it's established that they just have these quickies, uh, we can put the bullshit to the side and we can mm. go to it. You know what I'm saying? Right. So we're not expecting a snooze fest tonight. For no the first, snooze. first hour, that's what the show is going to be about. Right. And then we're bringing in... Um, Our special guest, Robert, tonight. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay. He has transitioned from being an agnostic to a theist, and he's going to describe to us that journey. So we're going to have a lot of fun here tonight at the place. Okay. And a lot of people think that this is a green screen, honey. Let's show them it's not. But let's make sure that we can walk up here and actually have a pillow fight if we'd <laughs> like to. You know what I'm saying? I know what this you're is saying. fun. And so for you guys that think that uh, this is a green screen, it really is. Uh, we love green screens around here, and we have a lot it's of real fun couch. Uh, here at the place. And so we are going to be throwing pillows tonight. We're going to be throwing all kinds of trashy talk your way. I'm joking, uh, but we're going to get started here in a few minutes. So let's bring on our guest. Welcome, Bob Graves. Hey, it's great to be back, and this is kind of like a special edition of <laughs> Inspiring Honesty Returns. <laughs> so Part we're, uh, Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's good. You know, uh, Greg and I have, um, you know, we, we went through uh, about a year and a, a slightly less than a year and a half of, uh, of, uh, of in, sometimes not even really bumping heads, kind of agreeing with each other and occasionally bumping heads. But tonight we're going to get into some of the head bumping, I suppose. And so it's it's great to to be back here, even to have Greg to to talk to, and I I I'm anticipating that uh, that he's gonna you know run away with his tail between his legs. Oh wow Smacks. wow! Smacks. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we're already hearing the tension <laughs> we're all, building. See, we're, I know. All, we're, 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 we're already. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, what say you about this? <laughs> well, you know, some of us uh, have either been born without a vestigial tail or have had it removed. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what kind of genetic abnormalities Bob is bringing to the table tonight. But oh. uh, I have no tail to tuck between my legs. Uh, <laughs> I, I can say that unequivocally right now. What uh, I, I will say is I, I look forward to, once again, I mean, I, I, I loved inspiring honesty and doing all of those wonderful conversations with Bob. And frankly, we do agree on a lot. Um, and we've disagreed only on a, a handful of things, uh, even through the, the course of our um, over a year of broadcasting together. And I think that the shows where we disagreed were some of the, the best shows and the most interesting to watch. And I look forward to once again uh, demonstrating to Bob exactly how and why he's completely wrong. So uh, I look forward greatly to the show. That sounds great. And we want to remind everybody this is not about, um, you know, theism versus atheism or us versus them. It's always about this versus that. And when we keep it in those types of um, context, uh, everybody wins. I always like it when you can't tell the difference between the theist and the atheist. Right. You know, you just can't tell. I like substance. I like the substance being looked at. In fact, I think that atheists and theists, 
in time will be capable of making the same conclusions about the same evidence. And I think that we're seeing a lot of that these days. But I don't want to hesitate this. I have a glass of wine waiting on me at the table of judgment. And so let's go to the table of judgment. Let's go. Yeah. And so here we go tonight. We're going to the table of judgment. We're getting ready to start. And so if you don't have friends called, that's on you. <laughs> Now, it's typical for us to be kind and nice, and we're going to remain that way tonight. But one of the things that we want to do well here tonight is to establish the kind of uh, discussion that is not monologue to monologue. And so, uh, since Greg is our guest tonight, uh, I'm going to ask him to go for it and uh, present maybe... Uh, we're not going to judge you too much according to a time clock. We're just going to uh, guess at it. And if we're a little bit wrong, big deal. Just stop when we say stop or we will send you to hell. <laughs> Good fair deal. enough. That's fair right. enough. I need a monitor up here. I cannot hear Gregory or Bob very well. And so if I can get uh, our producers to participate with us, that is in getting uh, an old man a hearing aid in a sense, uh, we can start. Okay, speak again. Um, testing? Can you okay, hear me now? Yeah, that's, that's very, very good. And so uh, go for it, Greg. I want you to introduce the topic, and I'm going to give you, let's say, four to five minutes, give or take, and let's see what you do best. I mean, put up or shut up. Come on, go. Well, this, this topic started when, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little bit of feedback from your end here now, I think, but it seems to have worked itself out, so, okay. Uh, the topic started when you, Dr. Jones, posted on, um, or in the Cult of Honesty, a comment that just said, I am a theist, but I do not like having in God we trust on monies or documents of governing. Uh, I agree with that, uh, I'm, aside from the I am a theist portion, uh, obviously, but the, uh, the issue that I think Bob and I really clashed about here was uh, the separation of church and state secularism and, and what that means, both in the context of how it was intended at the time it was written in the Constitution and also in it, the philosophical uh, position of promoting secularism now uh, as it sort of intertwines with the freedom of religion and uh, or free expression, free exercise of religion in even the modern day world. So I am very strongly of the position that Secularism, and I, I have to offer here a definition of secularism to, to some extent uh, that will hopefully um, demonstrate that a bit. This is from the Wikipedia. It says that one manifestation of secularism is asserting the right to be free from religious rule and teachings or in a state declared to be neutral on matters of belief from the imposition by government of religion or religious practices upon its people. Uh, another manifestation of secularism is the view that public activities and decisions, especially political ones, should remain uninfluenced by religious beliefs or practices and or practices. So I have to say that I am a, a strong supporter of secularism in both of those uh, iterations. I, however, the, the wording of the first manifestation, I might change a little bit. Uh, the reason being that I, or the reason that I support this has very little to do with the fact that I happen to be an atheist. Uh, it's true that being an atheist makes me a religious minority in the United States, that uh, I am surrounded by Christians and a Christian culture, a Christian uh, region of the world, and a, a very strong Christian history in this country. Now, I'm not the kind of person who's going to deny that this country was founded by people that came from a Christian culture, that brought Christian values and ideals into it. However, I, I will grant that there were a certain, or a certain number of the, the founding fathers, as it were, that were not really Christians, but more of a, a deist. Uh, but nonetheless, America is demographically, at the very minimum, a Christian nation. There is a huge amount of Christian influence and Christian privilege in this country. Uh, and I don't deny that, but I still take 
a, a very, very strong position that secularism, meaning a complete division between church and state, and that means not having anything from uh, that that is coming from a religious system or system, uh, values that cannot be justified without that religious system. There's something called the Lemon Test uh, that was established from a Supreme Court case that sort of breaks that down more. But a, a religious value system being brought into governing immediately and unavoidably reduces everybody's freedom of religion, meaning free exercise of religion and not and that's where I'm going to focus here today. The, the First Amendment says that the uh, government shall make no or no law establishing uh, a religion or respecting the establishment of a religion uh, or prohibiting the free <coughs> exercise thereof. And I, I'm not looking at this in an establishment sense, but very much in a free exercise uh, sense that any religious infiltration into the government that has no secular purpose beyond being a part of the culture is immediately and unavoidably influencing every religious and non-religious person in a way that it, it cannot avoid reducing their freedom to uh, of religion their their free exercise of religion so that is why I am a secularist, and I'm a secularist for my benefit, for your benefit, for Eric Hoven's benefit. I'd be a secularist for Cy Ten Bruggenkate's benefit even, but he's Canadian, so he, he can hang uh, out up there and uh, fight for his own right to be a secular. I don't think that uh, there is any way that we can have any religious infiltration into government and still have true freedom of religion. That's kind of my opening statement here, and I, I have to say that I don't know how much of that Bob will disagree with, but there's there's a couple of doozies of quotes that if you, I go to bust at you from the discussion <laughs> in the cult if you're uh, not going to take quite the stance you did in that one, Bob. So okay. have at her. Before Bob gets into it, I, I want you to rate your opening statement, and I want everyone in the crowd uh, that is... Uh, who might be making comments, rate the opening statement of Greg Bray. How would you rate your opening statement? If I had to rate my own opening statement, I wish I, but frankly, it's been a busy day. I, I got home at uh, 7.51 uh, to prepare for this. So I would have liked to have had about an hour to prepare uh, and, and get something put together. That was entirely off the cuff. And for that, being off the cuff, I thought it was decent. But uh, on a, a scale from 1 to 10, I'd give him maybe a 6. I could do better. <laughs> Ramble. Today. Okay, Bob. Here we are once again at the place. And yeah. I want you to step up to the plate, knock some home runs tonight. Let's see what you can well, do. Well, you know, I, I'd have to agree with Greg on this, that I, I think he could have done better. And, and I, you know, we, we, we both have uh, other things to do, so we're not always at our best when we're here as much as we'd like to be. Uh, so I think he could have been tougher, and I, and, I, and I think that if he'd been tougher, he could have maybe gotten like an eight or a nine. Um, yeah. And if he'd been real tough, he could have gotten a zero. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I, I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, Greg even quotes from the Wikipedia article, which is part of the series on irreligion. Uh, I find uh, that I probably disagree with, with a great deal of what Greg is saying. I think he's talking about something that involves secular totalitarianism. I don't think he understands what the freedom of exercise thereof. I think he's misinterpreting the Constitution of the United States and mis. Uh, interpreting from history the significant role that uh, separation of church and state played in our Constitution and the fact that it did play some role, but it didn't play the role it really wanted to. Uh, I also would have to, you know, really say that the secularism that, that, that he subscribed to here strikes me as being not only entirely oppressive, 
but something impossible to actually enforce without violating a great number of people. Unfortunately, the way the human race is, we don't all agree on everything, and we have to come up with a, with a way of governing our affairs uh, that involves a variety of people um, uh, coming from various different standpoints, and it has to, in, as much as possible, respect each of these standpoints. And the, uh, from many, not all, but many atheists seem to want to believe that it's possible for a human being who is theist to somehow possess a portion of themselves that is the theist part of them that doesn't come with them to government. And I say, you know, I am Bob Graves. I come to government with my opinions and my, my vote and my right to speech and my right to say things, and I bring all of me. And, and that includes my theism. I don't interpret the separation of church and state to be the separation of religion and state. I interpret it to be the separation of church and state, the church as an institution. And as I understand it, the separation of church and state, although there are a lot of atheists who would like to think that church is anything religious, uh, the truth is that prior to the founding of our country, uh, there were uh, most countries, the, the church and the state were so intermingled and their authoritative bodies were so co-connected that it was common uh, previous to our constitution that if you were, say, uh, in some countries, if you were the local bishop, you were the one who made the decision as to who the local law enforcement officers would be. It was your decision. You possessed the authority of the state by mere ex officio virtue of your religious authority and credibility. In the United States of America, we did away with that. You can be a religious person and you can be a citizen in the United States, but all of the decisions that are made in the United States of America are made uh, when it comes to the government by people who are duly elected, duly appointed, and they make those decisions by possessing the authority to do so in that manner. If they bring their religion into it, they bring their religion into it because they are religious and they have every right to do so. And if anybody wants to stop them from doing that, in my opinion, the only way to stop them from doing that is to be in the majority in a de democratic situation. So we are a secular nation in the sense that our authority and our due process is, is based upon an organization and a structure that is separate from the organization and structure of religious institutions. And we separated the two. Nobody who is uh, who has any so-called position of authority within the church can be telling anybody in the state, uh, or I shouldn't say they can't tell them, they cannot, by virtue of having that authority in the church, make decisions that are binding upon the state. They can't do it. If you want to make a decision that is binding on the state, you need to be duly elected or duly appointed. If your values happen to be, for you as a person, values that you came by because of your religion, that is just too damn bad for everybody else who doesn't agree with you, and it is your right to possess those values in the way that makes sense to you, and you have every right to bring those values to the process. You do not have the right to prevail in a democratic process unless your conclusion is also a part of the, uh, the majority. And also something that we have learned, I'm a parliamentarian, something we've learned from the democratic process is this, that when a decision is made based on due process, the reasoning behind the decision is often irrelevant. Many people can come to the same decision for various different valued reasons. And therefore, the different valued reasons that people come to deciding that a question is to be decided in a particular manner is in some ways, when it comes to democracy, irrelevant to the decision. So I would argue that this is secularism taken way too far to a place that is actually oppressive of people, and that although I can agree that there are people who are in various ways taken advantage of, that there's privilege, it is not possible in any society or culture for there to be anything other than, given the nature of human beings and given the nature of society, that whoever represents the major group in any society will inevitably possess an unfair advantage in various ways. That's just the way it is, and it would be that way no matter who the majority was. Now, Bob, just as I asked Greg a few minutes ago to rate his performance, his substance, uh, that is in the opening statement, how would you rate yours? 
Oh, I have no idea. I, 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 I give myself an, uh, an eight, maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know. Uh, I like me, you know, but uh, so I'm kind of biased there. Yeah, I, I love that statement. I like me. That's, yeah, that's a powerful statement. Oh, that is good. Yeah, you know, he always makes those good points. Uh, but uh, just for the sake of making sure that we're not getting into monologue and monologue, we're just trying to sell our car. Um, Greg, why don't you give a little bit of rebuttal to what Bob said, and then, Bob, I'm going to ask you, wait until I ask you, but I want you to give a little bit more rebuttal to what Greg is saying. Why don't you go for it for maybe three minutes, Greg, and let's see what you're made of. All right, well, Bob mentioned a few things in here, uh, specifically totalitarian secularism, uh, the misinterpretation of the separation of church and state, um, uh, a few things that had to do with democracy, uh, the, the, I guess that's related to that, um, how a position is come to or how a decision is come to is irrelevant um, the, and, and yet admitted that privilege is taken advantage of. Uh, so the, there's several things to, uh, to address in that and I'd, I'd like to get to it eventually, but uh, I, I have to address first the totalitarian secularism um, because I, I can't even understand what that term would mean. Uh, to, to secularism is a, a philosophy of, of governing that basically states that the religion cannot have a role in it. So it is what it is. Uh, I mean, I think that a, a totalitarian secularism is secularism um, and that anything that is not secularism is not secularism. So it's, it's sort of a a play on words, I'm happy to admit to being a teetotaler on this one, that I don't think any religious infiltration into the state um, can possibly be a good thing unless there is a valid secular uh, reason. And in fact, the Supreme Court agrees with me uh, on this uh, position. Um, there is Lemon versus Kurtzman, uh, Supreme Court decision from 1971, established the, the Lemon test, as it is called. It's basically, it's a three-part test. It says the government's action must have a, a secular legislative purpose. Uh, number two is the government's action must not have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting religion. And number three is the government's action must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. Um, it's not quite worded in the same way that I do, but essentially it's saying that if you cannot justify why this law is necessary or applicable without invoking your religion, then it, it cannot be a constitutional law. It also states pretty unequivocally that if this law serves the purpose of strongly promoting any particular religion, then that itself also um, is an excessive government entanglement with religion and, and should or completely rule out the possibility of that being uh, a, a constitutional law. Now, I bring up constitutional here because uh, Bob appealed to democracy. Democracy, as, as I see it, is a portion of what we have for our governing body in this, this country. We, we love to talk about it as a democracy, but truly we are a constitutional republic. Uh, in a democracy, the majority rules. And that's simple. Um, we put things to a vote, 51% or 60% or however you want to just determine the, the majority, then it becomes law according to that and, and that's great. However, uh, it's, it's only great for the majority. Um, and that seems like a significant improvement over a monarchy, which is great for the king and happens to be good for the people if you have a decent monarchy. Uh, or a decent king, but you know it was a big step in the right direction. But I think that the founders of this country recognized that it was not enough, which is why they created the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is it can only rationally be considered a, a document that exists or a set of amendments that exist to protect the minority from the majority in a country because it it's completely nonsensical to consider the majority. Um, that controls by, by virtue of their numbers in the vote, controls what the government does. They don't need rights. Uh, they are the government in that respect. 
uh, there are certain rights that, that they may still necessarily have, such as the, the right to privacy and a few other things that's, that talk about individuals in the government. But uh, aside from that, when we talk about things like the freedom of religion, um, there is no rational way in which that can be construed as something that should uh, mean that Christians, because they make up 51% or 65% of the population, should be able to basically create a Christian government as long as it's not officially run by any uh, leaders within the church. And even that, uh, Bob appealed to the, the leaders of the church or, or the people within the church, but the church is something that is nowhere near as relevant today as it was when the, doc or the Constitution itself was written, because we now have an incredibly fragmented uh, Christianity, and it's not a single uh, monolithic church to refer to. So to say the leader of the church is already to assume that we're, we're basically talking about Catholic or Lutheran, um, and even with Lutheran, you've got synods and divisions. So um, there's really no way for us to say that uh, it's, it can only be referring to the church in a modern context in any way. Okay, Bob, um, it's your turn to re oh, okay. rebut. <laughs> awesome. I had to bite my tongue there. Greg, I love you. Oh. <laughs> but you misrepresented the meaning of the lemon test, in my opinion, in an extreme and exaggerated manner that I, I find difficult to, to understand. For, well, first of all, the, the first part of that lemon test was that the government's action must have a secular legislate, legislative purpose. So, you know, the government is not going to decide whether or not we uh, a church ought to license a minister before they ordain him. You know, that that, that just doesn't have secular purpose. So the, the first part of this lemon test, it's not, it does not in any manner say religion can't have a role in it. It's just saying that the government's action must not have a must have a secular legislative purpose. The whole purpose for bringing the legislation pr before the government must have to do with questions that the government needs to settle and decide. Notice that it has to do with the purpose of the legislation. It doesn't say anything there about the motivations or the values of the people discussing the legislation, but the purpose of the legislation. What is the legislation attempting to accomplish? What problem is it attempting to solve? Why do we even have this legislation? So it's talking about the purpose of the legislation. It also says the government's action must not have the primary effect of either advancing or inhibiting a religion. It doesn't say that it can't inhibit or advance it. It's just saying that that can't be its primary effect. I mean, if we're going to write a law that you've got to ride your car on the right side of the street, but, but the primary effect of this law is to try to make sure that people understand that right is right and left is wrong, and so that we can kind of add to the feeling of this, and I'm just, you know, making stuff up here. But the primary effect of the legislation should not be for advancing uh, or inhibiting religion. That, and by th this means that we can't have, uh, uh, for example, in, uh, I think that this was just recently violated. The lemon test was just recently violated in Arizona where they passed this law that allows business owners to discriminate against gays uh, because it's the religious uh, opinion of these business owners that gays are, are sinful and, and it's protecting their religious freedom. The primary purpose of that legislation was to either advance or inhibit religion. I think that law fails the lemon test. Yeah. But this has to do with the primary effect, not any residual effects or other effects that may have occurred. And last, that it must not result in an excessive government entanglement with religion. In that, it's not, it, it's recognizing that entanglements are unavoidable. We just want to keep them from being excessive. But what, the way you're talking is you want there to be zero interaction of religion. And I'm saying that, uh, and as you said, this doesn't seem to make sense to you in terms of, you know, fairness or inhibiting, but the problem is that people have and cannot divorce from themselves their values if those values have been derived from their spirituality. The last thing that you mentioned was that, you know, things have changed in the church and as an institution is not what it used to be. It's now more fragmented. I agree with you on that, but guess what? That doesn't change the Constitution. The Constitution wasn't written in a day when it was fragmented, and so you can't just take the, institute, the Constitution and say, well, now that we're in a different context, I'd like it to apply in this way. 
you're going to have to come up with a new constitutional amendment to do that. You can't just say, uh, in keeping in the spirit as I've interpreted it, we need to do that. So I think you've even admitted that we're in a very different context here socially, and I think it does present some real problems. And, uh, you know, so I do think that there are going to be some issues here, and no doubt it may someday come to the fact that we may need a new... A, a new clarity on this, but I certainly hope it gets written by people who are far more intelligent than the theists and the atheists who currently tend to be involved in government, because I think they're both ridiculously narrow-minded. Well, well, there's only like two or three atheists in government, so... Unfortunately, okay, but, but before yes. you guys go on, I, I want to state something, because right now we're going to move into the next phase of this conversation. So we are going to give both of you guys seven minutes together so you can interrupt each other, but we need to demonstrate to the audience that civil conversations can be had, but with a lot of passion. And so you have seven minutes. Go for it. Sure. You know, but basically, by the way, my position is... Bob, you're a jerk. You smell... Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Not what we were looking for. But, I, but, but I'm a nice jerk. Right. Well, Bob, I, I wanted to open here to say that uh, I I do I feel like my position is being misinterpreted to to some extent uh, when I say that there cannot be um, any religious uh, in uh, infiltration into government. I'm not saying that things cannot coincidentally overlap with things that are also re religious because frankly, religions deal in moral codes. It is virtually impossible for us to come up with any law that will not coincidentally overlap with some religion or another um, in, in what it's advising. That's, uh, I, I think logically it's, it's probably completely unavoidable, uh, but there might be a way we could put it together. Sure. Uh, I mean, the fact is murder is illegal because yeah. murder uh, has all kinds of good reasons to be illegal, not because it's a, in the Ten Commandments that thou shalt not kill. Um, and that happens to overlap, and that's, that's entirely okay. The, the real issue behind secularism is that the primary purpose of any law needs to have a, a secular motivation behind it, and a secular no, justice. No, 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 not according to the Lemon Test. The motivation for the law, the purpose of the law is what it's talking about, not the motivation. People, besides, the truth is psychologically, who knows so, what I, your motivation I, is? I intended to, to yeah. when I said the the purpose, I was amending yeah. what I was saying. From I wasn't trying to, when yeah. I said motivation, uh, purpose, I was trying to amend. Yeah, yeah the, the problem that we need to solve and why it needs to be solved, you know, uh, I, I would agree with you needs to be secular. By the way, I think that what you just said now makes a lot of sense. I, I, I don't find anything wrong with it. I just don't find it to be the law. I find it to be your opinion. And I'll tell you what, if the majority of the people who were going to interpret the Constitution and if the laws that grew out of that opinion were the majority view, I would have no problem with that being the majority view either uh, because, you know, I don't see a big difference between what you're saying and the lemon test here necessarily other than the fact that it's not the lemon test. You're taking it a step farther. Uh, but I, I do think that you are somehow... You, you, as an atheist, you somehow feel that this theism is somehow, uh, uh, you know, like an appendix, uh, you know, some sort of a vestigial organ inside of the uh, the brains of religious people, instead of something that is part and parcel of their whole being, in a way that is in some ways inseparable. And I think that you're coming up with something that can be. Um, intellectually uh, compartmentalized, but I don't think in a human experience it can actually be isolated. Well, I don't deny that it is, in, in fact, in part and parcel. I mean, their, their motivations, their uh, values are, are strongly, again, it, we're, we're in a Christian culture, so even my uh, motivations and values are still influenced strongly by uh, Christianity, by the fact that I grew up in Wisconsin, the Midwest here, where we have sort of a different way of, of looking at things than the people growing up in Seattle or in Texas or mm -hmm. in many different areas, you're going to have the values that come from your culture. Christianity is a huge part of the culture uh, beyond uh, plenty of other things. So you're right. Even if we were all to become atheists today, we'd still have a primarily Christian culture in, in many ways. Um, but, and, you know, by the way, you've talked about this before, and, and I can even agree with you on this. I think there are ways in which a religion has excessively uh, influenced 
things to where I really feel, I hope that the challenges can be made successfully. For example, in Texas mm -hmm. and in what is it, six other states, you mm -hmm. cannot actually, according to their constitutions, run for office if you happen to be a self-declared atheist. I think that was like our second or third show we talked about. Yeah, that, that was and uh, that's because I was in me, Texas. Which that's is ridiculous. One of the where you're you're not allowed to hold any public office if you're the free exercise thereof means if you're an atheist, you're an atheist. If you're a theist, you're a theist. Okay, just be who you are, you know, uh, freely. Uh, and so I, I I would see that as um, you know th those requirements. I, I'm surprised that they've stood. And, and well, actually, the only reason they remain standing is because of the radically unpopular position it puts the person in who puts forth the the uh, the motion to pass the legislation to remove it. Oh, you godless person, you! You know, and so you know, there's that problem. But I can agree that that is excessive. That that is, uh, uh, and, and and in fact, I think that given the lemon test. That if those things were actually to come up to the Supreme Court, I think the Lemon Test would set a precedent that would that would also be part of the interpretation of of those requirements as being unconstitutional. Well, I, I think that uh, you're right that most of these things, if they were to actually come up, uh, would be declared unconstitutional. As a matter of fact, even things like the "In God We Trust" on the money or "Under God" in our pledge have been declared unconstitutional by federal courts, but. Uh, they, uh, unfortunately, through appeals and, and other um, uh, various processes, they've gone to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court has uh, opted not to hear the cases due to an issue of standing, saying that there's, nobody's uh, demonstrated sufficient harm um, from this. Which uh, and, and, and by the way, that is something I think is an important point. I think that part of living in a democracy is this. I don't think I have the right to hold anybody else responsible for how offensive I find their opinion. I think I have the right to hold them accountable to their opinion, but if I don't like their opinion, that's my problem. If my religion has anything to do with my position and you don't like that, I say tough. You, you don't get a say in that. I alone get to pick what my opinion is and why it is my opinion. And, and you don't have to like it either. But, uh, you know, it's not my problem if you don't. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it's important to, to recognize. Now, when it comes to the in God we trust on the coin, um, I, think, I personally think it was a bad idea. But the, as, I, as I understand the history, that, that, came, uh, that came about as really um, part of our, I would say, our absurd obsession with communism. You know, e even the Vietnam era, the, the, the ridiculousness. I mean, I don't like communism. Personally, I kind of like the way we do things better, but you know, if if there are people who like communism, they want to be communist. They got every right to be communist. Well, can you they tell me it, the, yeah. what the the purpose, the primary secular purpose of uh, putting under God into our uh, pledge of allegiance or um, uh, in God we trust onto our our money was? Is that oh, I, 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 under the, I think there were two different reasons there. Uh, uh, Both uh, happened within, a, I think, a five or six year span of each other. I mean, yeah. they, In God We Trust was on coinage for a long time, but for it to become officially the motto it, and put on It, it came and went. It was there. It came and went, but without any real official decision to do so, just the design that happened to be on the coin. Right. I think it was uh, all I between think, the, in 1952 and 1963 yeah. was sort of the span in which these things happen. So it was, what, it was, what would, uh, from what I understand, the purpose was to celebrate my birth. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was born in 51. And, uh, but, and I had already had a huge influence by the time I was one. No, uh, I, I think that you know, that was the beginning. It was an attempt to distinguish us to the world from, uh, from what was perceived as atheistic communism. And I don't think that the people at the time, seeing as that we were... You know, so uh, saturated with Christianity at that time, I don't think the people at the time even it, that it even occurred to them that you know someday we're going to regret this. I think that you're you're probably right. There were yeah. I'm sure people who objected to it at the time. I, I have sure. absolutely yeah, no yeah, doubt yeah, it, in my mind. But they they had cooties. They were you know they yeah, and I mean that. I mean they were they were the the naysayers who were such a fringe voice that they were kind of <laughs> let's humor them and forget about them. Uh, they they unfortunately did not have 
a voice. Well, I think, though, I, can you agree with me at least uh, that if this were to go up against the lemon test at this point, um, I would in God we trust, uh, in your opinion, I, I – would at this point in time, I, I at this point in time, I can't see it passing the lemon test. But also, we're not, you know, we're not as as um, adamantly anti-communist as we used to be, and communism isn't as much of a perceived threat as it used to be perceived. So I, I don't even see the communism. What the I want to take a, just a moment because we have a yeah. viewer comment that I sure. wanted to address. It came from a, um, a YouTube user. Uh, you put the gay in gangster. Um, that, which I'm hoping is referring to me personally. Uh, but uh, they said that uh, communists held that position too uh, when I was giving my, my opening statement. And uh, that's another thing that I, I did want to address um, and, and I will be addressing at some point. I just wanted to bring that up because this is yeah. intermingled with communism and, and atheism and, and secularism is often used. Don't necessarily want to address that now. I just I thought it was interesting and, that you, you and mentioned. And I, I regard that 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 whole era as being a bunch of people reacting to something with uh, I, I don't know. It strikes me now as delusional. I, I wasn't around at the time, so maybe I can't appreciate the delusion. But um, I, I don't see how any country being communist, as long as we're de democratic and we have the right for people to speak up and have a voice, uh, you know that. Um, I don't see that there's any harm in other people having different attitudes and philosophies and, and running their own government in a different way if that's what suits their purposes. And when you know Vietnam is going through their own civil war, the fact that uh, one of the factions preferred communism well, is still our business. That's really easy, though, to say. Yeah. From, I mean, you're, when we're talking about communism and political systems, I mean, those those may be similar in many ways to religion, but I think that religion, uh, intuitively and anthropologically, has a a different uh, connotation to the word. Um, in what we're we're talking about with that, and and there is a uh, to what word to religion versus to sort of the political systems that that when we talk about religion, uh, as much as uh, communism or uh, socialism or capitalism, <laughs> carry uh, you know the political philosophies that people bring to the table. They don't. They're not really what we would consider to be religious positions, even though they are. Uh, uh, I'm not sure what you're saying. I, it's not clear to me. I mean, because I I'm under the impression uh, that it, particularly in the West that 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 theists perceived God as being over government, in fact, even the founder of government, and, and that they, they kind of see it, saw this as a hierarchy, including even when it gets down to the hierarchy of the man and the, of the home, the wife, the children, uh, you know, that this is all part of the hierarchy. And, and I think they saw it as different facets of the same aspect of our existence, you know. I think that you're right, especially, I mean, from a, a historical perspective, that you, you're absolutely right, sort of the divine, uh, um, I, it, what is it, the divine right or the, the yep. ordination coming from God. But uh, there, there is, let, I let think, me the, the reason you, I, you I guys, wanted to say you, you guys Can I just finish passed? this one point yeah, go, real quick? Go for is it, that, the reason I, I brought up the, uh, the political systems versus religion is because you, you said that the um, you don't have a problem with people, you know, some people wanting to have a communist regime and some people want, you know, like in, even in Vietnam. Um, I agree. I think that that's, you know, part of how uh, politics work. But I think that uh, there, there is a significant difference between people promoting a theocracy of any sort uh, versus people promoting a um, yeah, I'm glad we don't have one here. economic system. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's kind of where I'd like to go after this. So, uh, Dr. Jones, yeah. thank you for letting me finish that thought. Okay, I wanted to interrupt you guys because you guys have been demonstrating what NCG is all about. An atheist and a theist can come here, have a rational conversation, and it doesn't get polemic, out of hand, etc. And, and this is really good, but I want to give each of you uh, three minutes. Uh, it's like when my wife and I, we start discussing. Sometimes we talk about... Discussing. Yeah, discussing. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. We start discussing uh, what is there about your argument that I, I don't like? In other words, Greg, what is the weakest part of Bob's argument? And then I'm going to ask the same question to Bob. What is the weakest part of Greg's argument? You know, I was going to ask him the you, same thing, but I was going to say, Greg, um, say what the dumbest thing Bob said was, and I was going to say, <laughs> we'll, we'll let him do Bob. both. What's the weakest part of his argument? Well, the weakest part of mine. What's the dumbest Greg thing he said tonight? Nice. The most ridiculous. Oh, okay, you've got three minutes, Greg. Go for it. See if you can score some points. Play some basketball. 
Okay, I think that honestly the weakest position that, that Bob is coming from here is that he's he's trying to, to argue this from a historical um, perspective as far as what the framers of the Constitution meant at the time and what what was relevant at that time and to apply that as if it is still relevant today or, or to say that we may need to make new amendments to the Constitution. Now, I'm, I might be willing to support the idea of new amendments, but I think that the, the Constitution is by and large interpreted as a, uh, a living document by the vast majority of the uh, constitutional scholars that are out there. And, and even some of the language in it indicates that it, it should be sort of interpreted as time comes. And many, or many of the writings of the people who were the associated with it, they, they recognized, and from their own personal histories, as well as uh, their ability to project into the future, that times change, and with them, uh, things, uh, ideas, concepts become outdated, and you need to have a government that's capable of, of keeping up with that. Um, even putting or giving us the opportunity to make amendments to the constitution, or constitution shows that they uh, anticipated it uh, needing to be changed at some point in the future. But I think that the creation of the Supreme Court and other things indicate um, that there is more to it. Beyond that, though, uh, the reason that this is the primary weakness of Bob's is because it applies only then to the American political system under the Constitution that we have. And I am promoting secularism as a universal best practice for government, regardless of if it is under the American Constitution uh, or if it is in Afghanistan, where my brother is currently serving in the Marines. Uh, I, I think that we need to recognize that we have a, a pretty secular government if we're nitpicking about things like uh, should in God we trust beyond the money. But in places like Saudi Arabia or um, Afghanistan or Yemen, uh, that is not anywhere near the case that's, that they're dealing with. And, and anybody who wants to say that a, a simple democracy should be able to institute whatever the majority of the people um, want to institute uh, is it really, it, you're bound uh, by, or, or duty bound to recognize how that is manifested in other parts of the world and, and you're responsible to recognize that this is an issue for people that are suffering under severe theocratic governments and and I will be the first to admit that not all of these are democracies or even good democracies but let's take a, a look even at Egypt where they just recently had to do a second uh, political uprising and overthrow their government once again because after doing it the first time the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and and again by democratic vote uh, it, it became an Islamic Republic and a theocratic rule and there, were a, there was a significant enough uh, portion of the population who revolted against that and was able to uh, overturn that government. But could, it, could, it wasn't. Could I, I don't want to interrupt you, but I want you to get to also your weak point. I would also, you know, that's, I think well, in I some sense. my own weak point as well? I, I yeah, yeah. Just you're, 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 you're going also astray from, I think, the topic personally, but maybe. Well, maybe I, but anyway. It, 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 uh, my, I, I guess to, to summarize there. And the, the reason I think that's your, your weakest point is because it applies only to the American system and only to your understanding of how the Constitution should be interpreted, which is not necessarily um, congruent with the, uh, the, the other, uh, I mean, the, the scholars that interpret the Constitution um, or the, the lawyers or the judges that do. But the, the weak point of my argument is that uh, Bob's right, it can be taken uh, to an extreme and and people can look at things and say well this has some sort of religious um, recognition or religious uh, undertone to it and therefore we cannot allow it and end up going by way of the communists um, of Russia or currently in North Korea or China uh, various places where it is illegal to be religious that is not however Secularism, and I know this sounds like a true Scotsman or no true Scotsman here, but I, I have to say that the weak point is people that come at something from a secular philosophy can misinterpret that, go off the deep end, and basically come to the position that religion should be outlawed um, and that it should be punished and it has no place in public life. 
Um, and I've even seen secularists here in America try to say that a any sort of religious teaching to children is abusive and should be outlawed. So that right there is uh, evidence that it can certainly happen even here. Since we're not literal literalist here, uh, we're not using the kind of time clock that's exactly three minutes, and so that was a little bit of an expansion, but that's fine that's, because that was fine. Uh, yeah. we, we are having fun here tonight. So, Bob, what are your concerns? I mean, what's well, the worst I, I thing about Greg's argument here? Because in well, a minute, well, all of you guys are going to hear from our audience. They're sending cool. in all kinds of comments. Wonderful. And they're griping yeah. and complaining and even <laughs> cheering. Cool. I would say the weakest part of my argument is that I don't think that our track record is a very good one. I think that the United States of America, and, and, and this is not um, a criticism of our way of government, it is really uh, pointing out the, the, the process of development and growing up that we've gone through. I think we started out with, with, with a great deal of wisdom in some ways. But it, but something that was quite hypocritical in other ways. You know, I mean, when when we came over here and we exploited this land from the Indians, give them blankets filled with uh, with disease and 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 did a lot of other things. I don't think that our track record is all that good, and I don't think that the uh, that the majority has always been uh, fair-minded, even-handed, or proper with the minority. So I think the weakest part of my my argument is that um, there's been a great deal of of bad business going on. Uh, under the the process that I have been um, arguing for, however, uh, you know I would have to say that uh, the weakest part of what I see in Greg's argument is this: Greg is talking about an ideal that he's perfectly capable of talking about, and that he's certainly capable of championing and and asking to become uh, the way we do things. But uh, I think he's also admitting that um, you know. Uh, He's saying I'm, what I'm saying applies only to the American system. Well, I'm an American, and we're talking about separation of church and state as we've tried to do it here in America. And the Constitution is the law. It is the law, not just what we think it ought to say. Uh, but and and in, in terms of it being a living document, um, I, I do recognize that there are many people who like to interpret it that way. I consider that as a linguist extremely foolish because it automatically puts into law the way language can drift so that we end up having laws that nobody ever passed. But just because language has changed in that manner, now that becomes the law even though nobody ever voted it in by any kind of due process. It just kind of evolved that way. And I certainly don't like the idea of thinking that I could be held accountable for laws that passed just because the meaning of the words changed. That's not, uh, that's not appropriate. We have to uh, recognize that sometimes laws need to be updated. And yes, society changes. And I think that's one of the reasons why we need to sometimes update a few things. Uh, and uh, if a simple majority isn't good enough for the process, the alternative is not a good one. Now, uh, it w the example of Egypt that was brought up, in my opinion, is, is an exact example that proves my point. This is not a static thing. We can't just do it. The truth is, the only way human beings can get to a good place is to start from where they are. It's a process. We have to start where we are. We are religious people. I would even admit we are religious people to a fault, a lot of faults with our religion. But if we're going to get someplace else, we have to get there through due process. Our governmental system here is not just a system where this is the law, that's the law, currently this is what we're saying, this is the legislation we've passed. We are also a government that possesses a, a methodology and an approach to how we can change things. And because that Allow, allows us to change things based upon the authority of the freedom of speech and voting people in, we can take this anywhere we, we can. And we can't take it anywhere we can't get it to go. And there's just no other option available to us. And so the, the truth is that we cannot isolate or separate from any of us what our religion may or may not be, just as Greg can't separate from himself his atheism. Uh, this, is, this is the way he sees things. And, and I think that in many ways um, I can appreciate how this makes sense to him 
uh, from his standpoint because he, he is an atheist, but um, perhaps he's never really had the experience of how we try to integrate all of these issues that deal with our involvement in our government if we come to it from the standpoint of being theists. It's, it's a different uh, context for us, and I don't know how to separate it from myself, and I would not appreciate anybody trying to separate it from me. But we can go through the process of growing up and learning how to do this better, getting rid of the oppression that does exist, uh, so that I think that uh, the, another weak, weak part here is that Greg is describing this as a static ideal. I'm defending a process that can take us places we need to get to and that we really haven't arrived at yet. Honey, this has been fun. I think they've made some wonderful points. Uh, the discussion, by the way, is not over. It will continue. But we want to go to Joey here in a minute. Do you, uh, do you mind, what, what, Dr. What you Jones, please? No, go ahead, before, Greg. Before we end this, I have one question I'd like to uh, ask Bob, um, if that's okay. It's, it's inspired by Batman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're talking about Bruce Wayne? Well, I, I mean, we're, we, we name, are getting Bob. ready to go to the comments, Greg. But he has a question specifically for Bob. Well, oh, okay, we, we have that comment in the comment section is my point, because well, Joey was getting ready to read uh, Bruce Wayne's comment. Oh, well, perfect then, if, uh, if okay. Joey's going to... Get that one. Uh, well, actually, it, it's by there's sort of a combination of Bruce Wayne and Christopher Hitch slap that I wanted to ask. So, uh, Joey, sure. have at her. Okay. Joey. We're going to editorialize. So, let's give it to Joey okay. for a moment and see what he can do with it. Sure. Uh, he might destroy everything, but we so <laughs> appreciate uh, all of our audience simply making comments. We want you to be a part of the show. We're going to start reading all of your comments, where as many as we can, that is chosen by the staff in the back. So if yours doesn't get read, please complain. Okay, Joey, take it away. Low internet. Can't hear you on our end. <laughs> on my end, at least. My mic yeah. Was <clears throat> Hello, internet. <laughs> this is a violin, and these are books. And these are the comments. <laughs> Kevin Buchik, if that's not how you pronounce your last name, it is now, says, I'd like Bob to answer Bruce Wayne's question. What was the primary secular purpose of In God We Trust? Rom Johnson says, well, Bob, you are wrong. <laughs> Hunter, too, says, if all religious people were like Bob or Dr. Jones, there would not be a problem. But when you have the likes of Ham, Hovind, then there is great danger, and they're having the ability to make laws. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Christopher Hitchlap, our own director here in the studio, says, did anyone see where I left my pants? Not an appropriate comment, I don't think. Ron Johnson jumps back in and says, please bite your tongue till it drops off. Hunter too comes back with a, but Bob, the keeping atheists out of offices is the vote of the majority. Good point, Hunter too. Christopher Hitchlap jumps back in. Bob, would you be so sanguine if a religion with a majority vote did not allow you to be married to your wife? Hmm? It was only for religious reasons? You put the gay and gangster, says. Shout out to you put the gay and gangster. And he says, Bob just pwned Greg. <laughs> whoop, whoop. <coughs> I'll leave a blind squirrel. If I do not <laughs> Jay Phrase 2 says, conservative Christianity was pro-slavery. Ron Johnson says, Bob. <laughs> Bob likes himself. <laughs> <laughs> Christopher Hitchlap says, Bob thinks it failed, but does that mean it did? Hmm? <laughs> and finally, 
Ron Johnson, always with the last word, says, Bull, that only happens when you have rulers, i.e. in CG. <laughs> <laughs> Very well, good. Uh, once again, we've heard from the prophet Fakwa, it we seems. Have. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. <laughs> and so uh, I'm going to give uh, both of you guys the final say in this particular uh, conversation. Did you have anything to say before this conversation ends? Because if they spend two minutes just with their closing thoughts, that would be wonderful. Yeah, I'll, I'll reserve myself. I, I had a comment uh, for each of them, but it's probably not. Go ahead. Well, you know, Greg started out saying, you know, um, talking about Cy, because he was Canadian, he really wasn't relevant in this conversation. And then Greg wound up going, you know, global in speaking about this scenario, you know, where it hits in, in different continents. Um, and then I was going to mention to Bob, when a judge walks into a, a, a courtroom, he has to devoid himself from every, you know, pr potential prejudice. And that would have to be horribly uh, difficult. And so when Bob says, you know, to go in, he would bring all of him, his theism, his this is and that's. You know, a judge doesn't have that um, liberty or, you know, really, he shouldn't, but I, I think they do. So uh, that would be awful hard, awful hard to do. That was just some comments. Random. Random. At the best. Cool. At the best. Okay, you've heard from my wife. You've heard from the Prophet Fakwal, actually, Joey. And we want to hear from you. Greg, go first. All right. Well, um, first, it's been a pleasure to be back, and I've really enjoyed this. Uh, but I, I wanted to address what Rhonda said uh, exactly. I was hoping that the uh, um, uh, Canadian thing was uh, recognized as a uh, tongue-in-cheek there a little bit, um, <laughs> <laughs> because Cy can fight for his own rights. Uh, yes, but, uh, we've seen that. I, y yes, I, I tried to say in my opening statement that this is uh, something I, I want to look at as a constitutional question but also as a philosophical question, and that's uh, that's sort of where I come at it from the the global scale. And I think that honestly, some of the the viewer comments were more powerful than anything I could come up with. And, and specifically, um, the one uh, the the prophet Fakwa read there about, uh, or from Hunter Two about how not allowing atheists into office is a, a position that could easily and has easily been uh, come about through majority rule. Um, atheists make up a very, very small minority of the population. It's a growing minority, but uh, even if we look at the, the nun, this is not Catholic, but nun, um, as in zero, uh, religion, they, uh, we make up only about 25% or 30% of my cohort and less and less of the, the higher numbers. So we're still a minority and outnumbered by the Christians in America. Um, and we therefore could very easily be subject to a theocratic or, or everything for all intents and purposes theocratic rule by simple majority rule. Um, and I think that uh, the, the comment uh, from Christopher Hitchslap was really poignant as well about um, if you would still be in favor of this majority rule concept if it were to say that you can't be married to your wife, because that is a completely relevant question for a large amount of our LGBT community that uh, cannot be married to the people that they love for a reason that can really, in any context I've ever seen, and only be defended from a religious position. Um, and I see uh, uh, all sorts of other examples where we can say there's really not um, a, a secular purpose to this, and I think that, unfortunately, um, that being that the United States has such a long Christian tradition and, and historical tradition, and you, of course, coming from that yourself, Bob, I think that you're, you're blinded a bit by your privilege in not thinking about this from the context of what if the atheists took over? What if the Muslims took over here? I mean, we see laws popping up in states like Kansas uh, that are explicitly 
uh, ruling out Sharia law while at the same time trying to explicitly put creationism into our public school science classrooms. And it's the, the most insane contradiction I can possibly imagine. But according to majority rule and, and a simple majority, these things are, are perfect, not only perfectly defensible, but would be exactly how we would accomplish things if it weren't for the protection from the Constitution. Uh, and I do believe it needs to be interpreted in a modern day context and how these things apply. Um, so that's that's really kind of the the closing of my statement is I, I believe that uh, um, I, well one one last thing uh, is that I need to make an apology to Ozzy um, because I forgot that uh, he and some of our other friends are Canadian uh, and should therefore get some sort of I, I some rights whatever <laughs> what, what's the worst that's going to happen somebody's going to apologize to you <laughs> nobody bothers him in the igloo <laughs> right i mean you're in canada the worst thing that happens is somebody says sorry like a little bit shorter than what you'd prefer so um but uh, that, that's that's my my closing here is i, I think that secularism is uh, logically and philosophically the best way to protect everybody's religious freedom across the board in any context Thank you, Greg. Uh, Bob, what are your final thoughts on uh, this particular uh, conversation? Yeah, I, I totally disagree that, that secularism is the best way to protect religious freedom. I think it is, it is a proposed way. I think that depending on how secularism is expressed and embraced, it could be. Um, and I think that Greg has certainly um, represented a, a reasonable philosophy in many ways. I think that uh, that he has, um, you know, expressed something that he would like to see happen, and and I think that's something that our system could someday actually make happen. But I do think that the problem here is one of staticism versus process. You know, uh, what if the atheist were to bar my marriage by majority rule? Well, that would be unfortunate, and that would be the way that it is. But what else am I going to do if I'm not going to live under majority rule? Am I gonna am I gonna be an outlaw? I, that would be an option. I could do it. Uh, you know, on, on the sly. But the truth is, the only other option to majority rule is some form of inappropriate constitutional force. Republic. Well, we could have a constitutional revolution, but that requires changing the Constitution. You see, this is why I'm a believer in due process. It was majority rule that decided that a black person was three-fifths of a person, but it was also majority rule that freed them. It was majority rule that decided that women couldn't vote, and it was majority rule that decided that they could. It was majority rule that has made this horrific situation in Arizona, and it's majority rule and due process that'll get rid of it. What I'm saying is this. The authorities that make all of these changes changes happen are each one of them secular, that there has never ever been in our country a violation of separation of church and state. All of our processes are still operated by due processes. I can't help it that there's a bunch of idiots at the helm. And there are a bunch of idiots at the helm from time to time. But the thing is this, it's a process. And in the midst of the process, there's a lot of stupid decisions being made, a lot of insights that haven't been gained. But I believe in the process, and I think that the process is free from religious control, but it's certainly not free from religious people because it's a process that involves people, many of whom are religious. And of course, that makes it impossible to kind of divorce them entirely. So, uh, you know, I don't think that uh, uh, we have any other option but by majority rule and that that due process is going to have a lot of hiccups in the road, a lot of bumps in the road, many of them absolutely unfair and ought to be overthrown. But fortunately, we have a system that not only allows us to make some of these stupid laws, but also allows us to change them. And that the real problem that Greg has here is not so much his opinion, but that he needs to go out there and persuade a majority of people to join him in that, and then they can make it the law. But until that, they can't. Once again, right. uh, this has been a wonderful conversation, mm -hmm. honey. Um, I think that we're getting ready to move into another part of the show in which we have Robert here. He uh, was an agnostic and he has transitioned somewhat and we're going to talk to him in a few minutes before we leave uh, i would like to say thank you greg bray for being here you mean so much to us i'm looking forward to you coming back and uh, sharing your thoughts on evolution 
you gave us one of the best explanations of ex uh, of evolution that I've ever heard in my life. And so we're looking True. forward to doing this again in a different context. And so good evening, Greg. Well, I before Greg takes just off. a moment to plug my my new endeavor here as well. Um, we are are starting to launch, uh, and it's not fully. Uh, exposed yet, but uh, a Facebook group and Facebook page uh, called Inspiring Change. This is uh, my new endeavor that focuses more on social problems. Unfortunately, the, the group is uh, coming off to a bit of a rocky start, but uh, the, the concept is uh, a new way to approach problem solving and discussions about issues that have traditionally divided us. And anybody who's interested should check us out. Uh, the, the group is Inspiring Change Discussion Group on Facebook and the page is Inspiring Change. Uh, unfortunately I discovered after choosing that name there's another Inspiring Change in the UK that's some sort of like hippie alternative medicine thing. Not that one. <laughs> but, uh, our symbol is uh, it's like the humanist yeah. people holding up a globe with things and it says the name. Just, yeah. just keep your hair short Greg. Yeah. That'll work. And, and Greg it was wonderful talking with you again and I appreciate the exchange that you and I are capable of having and um, and and my view would also allow your view to become the majority view. My view would protect your view from ever being outlawed by the majority. So, uh, you, yeah, I, ho I would I would hope that when you when you become the majority, that you um, you, you listen to us when we complain about how it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> and I agree with you that we will become the majority. I think it's. I think it's probably <laughs> headed in that direction. The writing is on the wall, folks. Yeah. Uh, I think we need to bring the prophet Farquhar <laughs> back in. <laughs> okay. With that said, goodbye, Greg. Goodbye. Thank you. Take care. Uh, we are bringing uh, Robert on to the stage at this particular point, and he's getting ready to join us. I think this is going to be another powerful conversation. And so let's welcome Robert. Okay, we will do it. Come on, Robert. Uh, by the way, Bob, feel free to jump in at any uh, time. Sure. Uh, this is going to be sure. very comfortable. Uh, Robert is, uh, he, he was with us last Sunday night for a few minutes uh, in the studio. And uh, we talked to him briefly. We don't know a whole lot about his transition, but he came from one point to the next point. If you'd like to put that little transmitter up on top of the sure. table, you can. And so uh, you can feel a little bit more comfortable. Um, tell us a little bit about this transition. You were actually an agnostic. Is that correct? Yeah, I call myself a yeah, devout agnostic. Um, you know, kind of like the, uh, the U2 song, you know, I'm still uh, still found what I'm looking for. Kind of deal. You know, I grew up in a Christian household, um, middle class, um, pretty typical. Grew up in a place called Roosevelt, New York. Uh, we used to go to a Methodist church, and you know, so I kind of was indoctrinated early into the uh, kind of kind of a mainstream Christian faith, and um, was kind of saved and then you know saved. Uh, Asked Christ to be my personal savior a few times. They kind of didn't take, <laughs> which, not coincidentally, probably happened. You know, during times of you know problem, different problems in my sure. life. Right. What does that mean? It didn't take. I would, you know, I would. Like backslide that. Well, kind yeah, of just term. To, uh, I would, uh, you know, um, go through the normal process, ask them to, to to be my savior, pray, and be around other Christians and. Uh, maybe Bible study or something like that. But then, you know, a few days would go by, a week would go by, and I'd kind of, it kind of, you know, fade, uh, fade out a little bit. And I'd kind of go back to the secular life, I guess you could say. Did you find problems with being in the secular life as opposed to where you are now? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, everyone has problems in their life. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, I, Maybe I didn't phrase it right. Yeah. You know, so, sometimes I, I think that we look at secularism uh, as a no-no. Um, and then I, I think that sometimes in, in theism, especially, that we picture, oh, it's better to come out of the secular mindset into a Christian uh, perspective. And so I'm just trying to juxtapose that. I'm trying to look at both side by side. 
were there benefits to the secular mindset that you had as opposed to what you now have? Not really. It's, you know, what Karl Marx said, you know, religion is the, op op the opiate of the masses. And um, it seemed like the, the benefits always came when, uh, when I kind of got into the religious kind of mode and realm that, that coincidentally, coincidentally or not, uh, my life seemed to improve, in, you know, in various ways. Now, whether that's, you know, having hope in something and the structure of religion helps by itself, you know, is, is God, you know, making differences in my life? It's hard to kind of qualify that. Right. But, but I did notice when I kind of stepped into religious mode and prayed and kind of accepted the tenets that, that life was, you know, was um, generally better. And I've noticed in my life that, that devout Christians generally have a pretty kind of tight life and have their act together comparatively to, to, you know, to people that aren't kind of devout. You mentioned the term born again, I think, last week. Mm -hmm. um, can you explain that? I mean, are you born again? Yeah, I've, I've definitely um, accepted Christ as my Savior and um, kind of decided to adopt the Christian follower role. And that, that, that just is really just simply... Um, accepting the tenets and believing that, you know, Christ died for my sins. Um, having said that, uh, I have, um, I've always kind of believed in the ideal of Christ. Um, I made a point of reading the Bible from cover to cover. I don't remember a lot of it, but um, I noticed that Christ did live a kind of a pretty kind of tight life. He didn't really make a misstep ever. Um, Although he was tempted, uh, you know, by the devil and things like that, and you know, by beat, you know, having the frailties of being a man, um, but I never really, until re fairly recently, kind of went the next step and, and decided, you know, God is my kind of savior too, not just a role model. Okay, when you talk about God being your savior or Jesus being your savior, savior from what? Um, I won't say going to hell because I don't really believe hell is a place where you go and you physically burn and, you know, experience a endless, you know, infinite torture. I think hell would be a separation from kind of the glory of, of God and what God is and what Jesus is. Um, so it's kind of saving me from a godless life, I guess, basically. Do you think that, um, let, let, let's just, you know, let me ask this question. I, I'm trying to be careful with my words because I want you to feel, feel <laughs> really, really good. Really okay, okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, if I can loosen up, that would, that would really be nice. Uh, I, I, I guess my point is, you know, there are various theologies out there. And it sounds like what you're saying is, that you became this born again Christian. And because you became born again or saved, now you're no longer going to be separate from God. Am I misreading anything by that's making those statements? That's the theory, yeah. Okay. Now, uh, I do have issues with certain parts of Christianity, the, the, the things that, that make me, you know, make me think, like the, uh, let me try to mispronounce this right, the uh, exclusivity of Christianity, where it's kind of, you know, uh, you know, the only, the only way th to God is through through me. Jesus is stated where, basically, if you're you know a Muslim or a, a Buddhist or something, that you're kind of screwed. That 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 you're going to go to you know hell, or you're not going to you're not going to kind of know God like a, like a, a mainstream Christian would. And I, I have a problem with that. I don't know if you remember a guy named Cat Stevens, right? A musician from the '70s, right? Well, he had like a life-changing experience. He almost drowned, and um, he actually converted to Islam. And uh, he, I think he lives over in London now. He runs a school for children, is married, you know, with some children, and probably lives a pretty, a, a, a pretty um, good life in terms of, uh, of, of Christian values. You know, probably, do probably doesn't steal cars and probably doesn't lie too much. And the fact that, you know, uh, 
according to the Christian kind of tenets that he's not going to go to heaven is kind of, that kind of bothers me, you know. Yeah. Um, I like to think God is, a, you know, is a fair person and, and, and or say other people, uh, Kat Sigmund was probably, actually his name is Yusuf Islam now, mm -hmm. I think. Right. Yeah. It's probably, so, so, uh, no, it's probably exposed can, to. If I could just interject sure. a, a comment. Uh, so it sounds to me like part of what you're saying is that um, you've perceived at least a particular view of Christianity as simply possessing some accuracy that then uh, has allowed you to enjoy a connection with God, but you're not seeing this as necessarily um, something that is absolutely essential or people are just going to fry in hell. You, know, it, it, you just see it as being an accurate view of the, of the spiritual um, landscape. Well, for me, it is. I mean, I was exposed to it, and I understand it as, you know, I mean, any religion is confusing and can be contradictory. To me, it kind of works, and it makes sense, and, you know, it, it encouraged me to, to be kind of a good person, to go by the Ten Commandments and other things, and not, you know, cheat people over and be kind and things like that. But, like I said, it, it, it bothers me that um, it kind of says it's our, our way of the highway, too. Right. I, you know. I mean, surely, surely you don't believe that uh, only Christians have these, you know, basic morals. You know. Of, right. Of, yeah. I, I mean, I can. Some morals are, are innate. I mean, uh, you know, if you see uh, a dead body, you kind of recoil, just like even if you had no religion in your life and were never exposed to it. If you saw someone kill someone else, it would it would bother you probably. Right. If you if you if you're not you know a, a sociopath or something. Right. And so you know. Uh, most people don't steal. I don't care if they're, you know, Muslim, atheist, theist. You know, that's just not, I think, the majority of mm -hmm. humans. And so it's almost human common sense, uh, right. irrespective of religion. Yes, exactly. Yeah. You know, Rhonda, uh, one of the things I never mentioned to you is that part of the reason they call me the unconventional pastor is because I actually am a thief. No, oh. <laughs> just, I'm, just, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I was wondering, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not trying to not, not Christianity. I'm just, these are just some things I think about. Right, right. You know, you know I, I, I don't mind criticizing uh, different aspects of Christianity. And, and, and by the way, I'm not a Christian. Mm -hmm. I used to be. I, I walked away from it because of various reasons, but uh, mainly because it didn't make sense to me. Uh, that is, the Western model of uh, Christianity especially where you have this person called Jesus who had to be beaten beyond recognition and tortured to death to take care of my sins. That didn't make sense to me. In other words, why would you have to murder someone in order to somehow forgive someone? In other words, if I had to murder one of my children in order to forgive the rest of my children, my question would be, would I be a moral father? Right, right. Yeah, um, yeah um, and that's the thing. It's you, when I, you know, I guess when God decided to set Christianity up, uh, you have to kind of set, you have to kind of make a a kind of catch-all religion. You, it has to be kind of palatable to to most human beings. Like it's not going to make every sense to everybody, and certain people are going to have different problems with Christianity as it as it's written um, you know and it's confusing sometimes uh, a guy named Michael Shermer went, uh, I think said uh, right it's kind of bizarre and, and he's an atheist and uh, he said you know in terms of Jesus um, God sent himself to kill himself to save himself from himself you know it really is con you know confusing yeah. and could, you know could I, could I maybe make a comment here too that I think is that I think is relevant is um, I, I don't identify myself as a Christian all the time. Um, uh, sometimes I do, depending on whether or not I think it has meaning in the context. Sometimes I'll call myself a Jesuit, which means I believe in Jesus. Um, I don't believe that Jesus did die for my sins. I do believe he died, but I think that the story as it's told that he died for my sins is kind of a, a a new spin on the history that happened, but you know, so so I, I would consider myself a believer in Jesus. So you know, I would say that um, you know, there there are some of these stories that I find problematic, and like Dr. Jones, I find I had to walk away from Western Christianity, but you know, I've been entirely walked away from Jesus. I've certainly walked away from um, a uh, the concept of a substitutionary or penal atonement. You know. 
but um, uh, I think he loved us. Uh, he tried to confront our bad, our, 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 the horrible religion. We killed him. And uh, he, um, he didn't, uh, that didn't make God stop loving us. And, and it kind of showed that that's the extremes we can go to in rejecting somebody who's, who's trying to show us uh, religious freedom. And uh, and so we're kind of like done fighting it, you know. And so it's, I guess what I'm trying to say is this: there's more ways of thinking about Jesus than necessarily accepting all those traditional ideas and notions. Well, in case that you're just tuning in, we have Robert Curry with us um, tonight, and he has a journey from um, we'll call it theism to agnosticism. Back to theism. Is that sort of correct? Yeah, yeah. Okay. We just want to make sure people are on the same page. Uh, we have some viewers that are asking some questions. And um, the person that has the name, like, um, or um, 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 said, you know, Jesus didn't have to be murdered. And that's true. You know, he, he died. We all die. Uh, it just so happened he was murdered, and that's the way that we believe. We, we don't believe that Jesus had to die and have a blood sacrifice because if you think about it, how crazy is that, that uh, you, know, you have to have a human sacrifice, which is totally against, to me, any moral. I mean, that's like the number one you know, uh, moral uh, atrocity that you could commit um, and so if, if well God, humans are kind of fickle though you know if you had a soap opera where nothing bad ever happened to anybody no one would watch it you know so maybe you have to kind of catch people's attention you know, I, I guess <laughs> the, the, yeah, that's a good point but I, I think the point my wife is uh, making here is if if I said uh, to my children and I'm assuming that you know if we're dealing with Christian modeling, he is um, certainly the father of us all in this sense. We're all of God's created children according to Christian theology. And if that's true, if you took some of your children or all of your children and you said, I can't forgive anything that you've ever done without the shedding of blood. Now, if I took that and practiced the same thing that God did, for instance, if I said, you know, I'm not going to forgive any of my children for anything that they do without killing one of them, uh, would you think that I would be moral? And so the question would be, on a much larger scale, uh, is God moral if he requires the death of his son? I mean, like, he had to have blood to appease him. I mean, that's very paganistic. Mm. And, and you, know, you know, that's just black and white to me. And, and, and to make the point further, if I'm the kind of father who keeps a record of wrongs against my children, I resent them, I hold grudges. In fact, I, I send a flood and kill all of them but eight. What kind of father am I to my created children? Well, again, I don't know the answers. Um, I would just kind of retort maybe that humans are so flawed that um, God might have to go to extremes to kind of get their attention and, and make and, and, and um, have lessons that they kind of live and learn by, unfortunately. But, but we have stories in the Old Testament like this. You know, the first king of Israel, uh, Shaul, um, he was commanded by the prophet Samuel speaking for God go kill these people, one particular people group. He said, kill the men, the women, the children, and the, the infants. So we have the doctrine of infanticide and genocide. Mm -hmm. Another story um, is about Elisha. He's walking down the road and 42 children call him Baldy. And he turns around and curses the 42 children and then God sends two she-bears to maul them to death. So once again, the question is, is God in that kind of context, is he moral? I do think Some it would big be... big questions. That's a big yeah, question. <laughs> I, I do think it would be important that, um, that with, with Robert, that we, we, we realize that, you know, a step at a time, um, some of these questions, particularly if they're for the very first time, can be 
a little bit overwhelming. Sure. Uh, and and I agree that they are. Uh, boy, they they really complicate the the question of morality. And and of course, this is why I've left what I would call traditional Christianity. But uh, I I would I would think it necessary to be a little bit um, careful in that um, just as I think that these questions. Um, don't have good answers. They don't have good substitutes at this point in the process either. So I, I would encourage Robert to, uh, you know, kind of work these things through a step at a time, and and it could result in him yet having other changes, uh, but uh, not necessarily going back to agnosticism, but just having a very different kind of Christianity, or maybe even you know whatever. So. I, <clears throat> I guess part of what I'm saying is, is as I'm feeling a little bit like uh, we might be trying to overwhelm Robert with uh, with some of these questions uh, that I think are really good ones. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, the the first time you hear these questions, they almost beg of you to say, well, let's just drop everything, you know. And <laughs> and I don't know that that's the, the, the proper response. And so to, to take it a step at a time allows him to kind of uh, modify then and, and work with this and kind of uh, do it because the truth is, you know, even you and I, Doctor Jones, we didn't get to where we are uh, by just you know sitting down and having a conversation with ourselves, uh, starting out being fundamentalists and ending the conversation uh, not being fundamentalists. You know, it, it took time. I, I that's I totally agree. But I you know, I, th I think the million dollar question in, in my mind is, from theism to agnosticism, sh tell me about that leap. I mean, what caused you to move into that worldview? Well, I'll get to that in a second. Well, first okay. of all, you're not going to scare me off. I mean, I, <laughs> I, I like the people, like your hosts and people on the show, uh, welcome things that make you think. Um, you know, I have the same questions, too, about religion. I think about every day. And, uh, but to me, you know, Christianity works for the majority, kind of, on the whole, it works for me. Um, so... Uh, I question Christianity, but I, I consider myself a Christian and want to be a strong, good Christian man. So let me make that clear. I have friends out there that will just own me, if, maybe if I don't make the disclaimer. Um, so, uh, um, and in term, but in terms of uh, the change, uh, there are maybe reasons that are might seem counterintuitive and, and kind of strange. Uh, one of the reasons that kind of pushed me over is which will sound like the worst reason is that I have a lot of people, family and friends in my life that are very smart and kind of lead good lives from what I can see and, and almost looking at them and saying, you know, if, if they you know, believe in this for, for many years and it, it, it's been good to them and uh, makes them happy, you know, maybe there's something to it, you know. Um, and that's not the only reason, but um, just... Uh, Again, the, the ideal of Christ, the, the, the life he lived, um, whether you believe he, you know, he uh, died on the cross for our sins or not, um, is just very, very powerful to me, you know. Yeah, uh, I'm with you there on the teachings of Jesus. I, I think so awesome, so many fantastic things, um, like, like in Matthew 5, to tell us, you know, don't worry about what they said in the old times. I'm paraphrasing, you know, really loosely here, but... You know, I want you to love your neighbor, but also love your enemy. You know, and if somebody wants something, if they want your coat, whatever, give them something else. I mean, he, he was such um, a giver and, and a compassionate person. Mm. And so for that, I am all about Jesus. I really am. It, it sounds like the reason that you made this transition, and please correct me if I'm wrong, it sounds like, uh, has to do more with the compassion of Christ than anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, as I say, uh, don't talk to talk to walk to walk. I mean, if uh, if we believe, if if we can believe uh, what people wrote about Christ, you know, he set the ultimate example. You know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, if, if if you were walking on the street and someone kind of uh, walked by and called you a name, you know, the kind of human natural defensive instinct is to strike back and, sure. and kind of, well, he wronged me, I have to wrong them, where Jesus would often do the opposite of what your kind of hormones and your human mm -hmm. nature would, would, would dictate, which is to, to get angry or, you know, to right. kind of get, get, uh, get even. All right. I, I guess what I'm saying is I, I think that 
to crucify anyone. And I, I like what Paul says. He said, if they had known the wisdom of God, they would have never crucified him. In other words, I That's I a think, big if. Yeah, and, and so uh, I, I don't think that in the wisdom of God as Paul knew it, uh, anyone would have crucified Jesus. That is, to murder him like that or any kind of murder at all. And I, I guess... Unless the, someone was maybe truly evil. Yeah, but uh, the point that I'm attempting to make, and, and I'm hesitating because I think there is something that you're uh, seeing here that's, that's extremely meaningful. Uh, you know, you can murder someone uh, and watch them being beaten beyond recognition and tortured to death, and as you're watching them react to the very killers with kindness and patience and not striking back that really impresses me. In other words, what I'm trying to say, and I'm really stumbling for words here, uh, or with words, uh, I think the way that Jesus reacted to those who hated him, I think that's the thing that impresses me most. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that about Jesus, uh, that is the story of Jesus, how he reacted to those who persecuted him. We have a, a commenter, uh, old Jim Bob, and uh, he says, repent and Jesus will save y'all. So I'm... He's talking to y'all, I guess. I guess he's yeah. talking to us. <laughs> he's not talking to you. You're already saved and repented. So I guess he's talking to us. Repent. Okay. You know, I, it, it reminds me, and, and I, I understand uh, when people are standing on the street and they're saying repent or burn. I, I think that those people, in a sense, uh, feel like, you know, they really love me when they're stating that because they don't want me to burn in hell. I can understand that because at one particular time in my life, I did believe in hell. And so I, I was doing everything that I could to save people from hell because I thought, you know, God was this maniacal monster and uh, the wrath of him was kindled up against me and he was going to pour his wrath out upon all humanity and without the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, I was doomed to hell. I was afraid of that. And so out of that fear, I got saved and I felt transformed. I felt great. I felt relieved. I believed, uh, yada, yada, yada. Uh, since then, I've rejected all of those notions, to be honest with you, but I'm not against people at all, in any sense of the word, if a person finds that to, you know, make sense to them. Kind of the, end, the ends justify the means. Well, I, did, I disagree with the guys that stand on the road, uh, hoping I don't offend too many people with it, and, and kind of yell at you as you're driving by. I think, I think that's counterproductive. It just puts you on the defensive, you know? You don't want, you don't want someone yelling the truth at you. You know, but yeah, the turn I can't right. imagine what the psychological health is of a person who thinks that makes sense. Um, uh, they, they've either been driven by a subculture to adopt that behavior or, you know, I went to Bob Jones University and we were required uh, as a preacher boy. I was required to um, submit a weekly report of my evangelistic activities and when I look back at some of the activities that I was involved in, I, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I, I'm kind of astonished at myself. And, and, and today, if anybody was to ever require me to do that kind of thing, you know, it's just, are you kidding me? <laughs> no way. You know, but I used to stand on the street corner and pass out tracks and, and and try to you know get people to pray with me there on the spot, and I use the Romans Road or some other approach. And I remember the first time that, that my conscience bothered me about it. I was talking to a young girl who uh, uh, was very compliant with what I was saying. She loved everything I was sharing with her, and she prayed with me, and she accepted Jesus as her Savior. And she was very happy with the whole process that we went through. It was very easy. But then she asked me about her mother, who had just recently died, who had never gone through this. And my answer was basically, well, yeah, she's in hell. And this didn't settle well with her. Oh, duh. <laughs> but when, when that happened, I think that, you know, in my young and naive self, that I was kind of like, 
I wanted to have a different answer. I wanted to have, and, and, and I wasn't happy with the answer that I gave in terms of the, the impact that it had and what it said and what it implies. And it really, uh, really bothered me. Uh, but that was, um, you know, it, it really started to bring an end to my activities in that way and it actually got me starting to think about the, the reality of what I'm saying here. But wow, what a, what, yeah, I just feel, ter- I, wish I, I wish I knew who this person was. I mean, this, this was, we're talking about back in the early 70s. I, I just don't know how I may have hurt them, you know, right. and I wish I could somehow buy that moment back for them. Uh, really, I, I mean, this was her mom who recently passed away. What a horrific thing to tell somebody, you know. Right. Yeah, I mean, you know, sharing you some, something that, that, that makes you happy and you believe in is one thing, but kind of attacking people and, and, and because you think they, they, you know, they need to know what you know is a different thing. Yeah. Now, I started asking myself questions like this. Um, how could I be happy in heaven if my were, loved ones were in hell or separated from God eternally? I just couldn't be happy there. And, and so, you know, years ago, this goes back uh, many years ago, but uh, those things bothered me. You know, why would a father separate himself from children he loved? I mean, it's, it's, it's obvious that we all have problems, but when we have problems, we normally take them to a physician. If they have mental problems, we take them to someone who can deal with those issues. And so I, I find that even people like Adolf Hitler, who have committed all kinds of things because he had tremendous problems, I don't think that we should condemn them, but I think that we should love them and help them and find them some medical help. Would you agree with that? Um, well, I mean, as confusing as religion can be, I mean, what's the alternative that we just, we're ashes to ashes, dust to dust, which is no less cruel than anything in the Bible, that we just, we just these physical beings that kind of do our thing for 80 years, plus or minus, and then we just die and we're no more. I mean, that's not much. Well, I, I'm I mean, not... It's a good point. That is a form of cruelty right. itself, depending on how you look at it. Yeah. I, I agree. Uh, you know, I'm not suggesting that uh, we not believe because I'm very much a believer in Jesus. Uh, but I, I'm simply uh, one who is willing to say, wow, I don't have all the answers, but I certainly uh, think that there are issues, issues of morality with a lot of these notions that came from the ancients that I don't agree with. Yeah, well, no, no one likes someone who's comes off as self-righteous, and I definitely don't have all, you know, all the answers. Right. Um, but I want to know about your transition to agnosticism. Just no, give me a little... Oh, no, that's no, no, a transition from agnosticism. From agnosticism <clears throat> to uh, Christianity. Well, he said he was well, brought he, in the church. Before he made the transition okay. into agnosticism. Yeah, so he I'd went... I'd be theism. curious about how that happened. Yeah, okay. yeah I want to hear Just that. Just kind of the things, some, some of the things we've, we've been talking about, some of the things that don't kind of... Uh, make sense Make to sense. You. you know, I, I was lucky enough to go to Rome and saw the, the Vatican, and, you know, and again, uh, uh, <laughs> I don't want to be a, a, a Christian basher because I'm not. I, I, I believe what? in it, but, but, but you know, I, I don't think God would fault me for questioning things and... No. And being trying to be intuitive, uh, but like the Vatican is is like this kind of, kind of to me like a almost a palace built with gold, you know. And I think Christ would have a problem with that, you know. Mm, I think Christ would like a kind of a simple church that's not fancy and not huge, and you know doesn't have high proper property taxes. And that's one of the things I think about too, you know. Right, right. You sound like a an extremely compassionate person. Um, and well, I think you know, kind of guy. I have my, just like. Uh, Religion, as was written by man, has problems. I have my problems, too, obviously. My, my ex-wife could give me probably whip out a top ten list of <laughs> ten ways I'm an idiot uh, pretty quickly. So. Well, um, okay, so you go to Rome, and then you see all this, you know, opulence, and then you're just thinking there's something wrong here. Well, I mean, it's beautiful, and it, I, I sure. guess ostensibly it glorifies God and God's um, kind of um, glory and things like that. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there it is. It, it is a little. It's a little much. Almost hypocritical. A little yeah. over the top. Um, so then you start questioning some things. You know that in particular, and so then you, do you call yourself a, a Christian agnostic, or you now s- you mean? No, then. 
you know, a kind of a cultural Christian, I guess. Yeah. So, you know, at one point you said, you know, I've got a lot of questions about this, but it's okay mm -hmm. to question, even as a Christian, even as a atheist, or I mean, our life should be about always questioning. You know, never to stay in just a static position. Sure. Um, but then you decide to go back more toward Christianity. Did you feel bad about questioning ever? You know, did you feel guilty for questioning? No, not really, because I, you know, I know my qu questions kind of come from a, just a, a pure place of, of um, just not knowing, you know, right. not, not trying to be a devil's advocate, really, just for the sake of being a devil's yeah. advocate. Yeah. Not just, just trying to be controversial, yeah. but just yeah. tr trying to get to the truth and, and yeah. that type of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we have one of our viewers uh, who wrote, I don't understand why this focus is just on Christianity. There are other religions which are more compassionate and even moral. How would you... Are you asking Robert? Re ...reply to a comment such as this? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand the question. Well, for one thing, he's a Christian. That's why we're talking about Christianity. Well, I, I yeah. understand that. He's uh, not a Muslim I, I, or a what, Whether he knows much about the other religions or not, I don't know. I, I think that... Um, you know, many people don't know it, but there are actually people who could, uh, personality-wise, um, the psychological profile could pl put them in the uh, framework of a fundamentalist Buddhist. You know, where their where their demand of your detachment from things is is rather uh, abrasive and uh, totalitarian and dogmatic. Um, uh, it's certainly not the kind that that may, works its way over here to America, but. Uh, you know, every every religion in the uh, in the world has had its um, its finer points and its uh, not so fine points. Oh, what is the most important thing that you have learned that is about Jesus? Hmm, that's a pretty broad question. Mm -hmm. Um. Just that kind of be, besides the reading and the uh, the kind of dogma and what you hear that I actually um, really kind of feel them in my life now feel some kind of a presence which is very hard to explain, but um, it's not just a kind of thought process anymore. Right. You know the Apostle Paul he came came up with this idea, and uh, it's found in First Corinthians chapter thirteen, and I think you've probably read this passage before. He talks about love, what love is. He said that love is kind, it's patient. Uh, he goes further and he says that love doesn't even keep a record of wrongs. And so the question would be, if some of the writers in the Bible claim that God is love, and if this love, who God is, if he is actually kind and patient and he doesn't keep a record of wrongs, then why would Jesus need to die for us if he'd never kept a record of our wrongs? Hmm, I have to think on that one. Um, because we're talking about extreme kindness. We're talking about extreme gentleness. We're talking about humility. We're talking about a good father. We're talking about the goodness. In other words, Paul, he said, the goodness of God leads us to repentance, and the term repentance is a, a very churchy word, and it simply means that the goodness of God leads us to change our mind about things. Well, just I th maybe just because as, as, as hard as we try and as kind of pious as a life we live, we, we can just never get close to being God-like, really. We can try to live as Christ-like as possible, but we're just so kind of flawed, you know, it, you see kind of people sometimes that really you kind of get an overview of their life and they seem to really have their act together but as i get older i realize like like we're all kind of a mess in our own way whether it be hidden or behind closed doors or or whatever we just really you know, we're very flawed i mean human beings are amazing on one side but we're all kind of fl very flawed in our own way we're all kind of screw-ups in the end but but we're also capable of amazing things you know the human mind can be stronger than steel i think but I think that something extreme had to happen, and, and maybe that's an expression of how 
um, how loving God is that, that he would, you know, kind of send himself to suffer for human beings. You know, I can, I can appreciate um, how it is possible that one could, you know, see human beings as, as, as flawed. Uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that, but I, I personally would perceive it that, that, that human beings are developing and they haven't quite yet figured things out. So they're making a lot of mistakes. They are indeed missing a lot of marks. But, uh, but I think that, that flawed sometimes can imply um, certain things that may not be true. And I would say that even the underdeveloped um, aspect that we're in uh, still can require some of the same kind of radical wake-up calls and, and, and motivations towards um, you know, a better development. But um, I, I, when I hear you say flawed... Um, yeah, flawed might be I, a bad was, adjective. You know, flawed almost implies that it can't ever be fixed, but maybe right. just... Um, Maybe prone to uh, prone to mistakes. Maybe would be a better way yeah. to put it. Yeah, we we don't get everything right, and and we 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 don't have the the ability at this point in time to um, to, to operate without without a, a great number of sometimes very serious mistakes. Let Let's go back to a parental paradigm. Uh, we have children, lots of them, and <laughs> we enjoy our children. And they have many flaws, many problems. They're not perfect, they're imperfect. And uh, I find that holding things against them is not good. Mm -hmm. I find that resenting them is not good. I find that the best thing that I can do when they have problems and they are going through this, their struggles in life is simply to help them, help them to move past their immaturity past their problems. In other words, if they have mental problems, I'm going to get them to a psychiatrist. If they have physical problems, to a physician. Uh, if they have just issues growing up, I will simply keep picking them up regardless of how many times that needs to be done. And so once again, going back to what the Apostle Paul was saying, it was, it was really simple. Love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't even keep a record of wrongs. And so um, this is why I walked away from uh, the doctrines of atonement and all of that, you know, because if God is love and if love doesn't keep a record of wrongs, why would he have to die for something that he wasn't even thinking about? And so Jesus refers to himself as, in a sense, as this great physician. In other words, he says the sick need a physician. He wasn't calling us sinners. He was simply saying, hey, you have problems and you need someone who has good bedside manners. You don't need someone who will condemn you. Because mm -hmm. every time that I condemn my children, I'm not helping them, I'm hurting them. And I think you would agree with that. And so do we need the condemning factors of these God notions where the wrath of God is going to be poured out on me unless I get saved? Do we need that kind of... Well, I mean, mindset? on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm sure you've punished your children for various reasons. Uh, I've corrected my children. I've, help, help the, being empathetic of their problems is one thing, but you have to, to some degree, hold, hold them accountable when, when they do something wrong and make mistakes. Yeah, you know, when my children do make mistakes, and they make a lot of them, I try to help, and I'm very patient and very kind. And I have made some mistakes by uh, holding some things against them, and I've had to let go of those notions. Because if the Mayo Clinic writers are accurate in their assessment. They said that, uh, they wrote this, they said to forgive means to get rid of your um, resentment, to get rid of your grudges, to get rid of that stuff that you're holding against other people. In other words, the person who has to forgive has issues. I don't think that God has issues. I don't think that he has psychological problems. I don't think he's holding on to any of our wrongs. I think he's much more mature than that. I think he's capable of looking at, at us and saying, yes, you do have problems, but I have great bedside manners and I'm going to approach you with gentleness. Um, much like the, the physicians approached my father when he was dying of cancer, they didn't condemn him because he had this, this, this thing that just took control of him and killed him, but they, they loved him and that was powerful to me. I see Jesus as one who was willing to drink with the sinners. Even, mm -hmm. 
gets on his knees and bows before them and washes their feet. I don't find him even condemning the one who was caught in the act of committing adultery. I don't find him con condemning anyone. And this is well before he have ever died. And so, I don't know. I just thought mm -hmm. I would share that with you. And it's not as if he was saying, yeah, do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah no. I mean, no. I, yeah, no. I mean <clears throat> you have to love, but you do have to correct sometimes. And if, you, if you saw your child being mean to an animal and you kind of just let it and we just all love all the time, that might progress to murder someday. That might progress to killing animals and torturing animals and, and eventually killing a human being. You have to be fair but firm, you know. Yeah. That's one of the but first steps of becoming a sociopath, in right. fact. Right. Uh, being cruel but to animals and not having that um, corrected. Right, you know. that's true. And But we're just saying, um, yeah. I just can't believe that I'm a better parent than, than God is, you know, the Christian view of God as a, as a parent, I wouldn't torture my children forever and ever and ever for any infraction. You know, Rhonda, so I, don't think, do I don't think you're a, a better parent than, than God is, but I think you're a far better parent than the, the God that we've heard about. Right, yes, exactly. That's the way I wanted to phrase it. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just don't see that that's... Um, but, but based on, our, uh, based on our, our finite human understanding of who God yeah. is. I mean, that's just what you call uh, common damn sense. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's, natural for, it's natural for us not to understand everything that God does. But, but one of the things that... It's uh, not possible. Uh, but one of the things that uh, really troubles me uh, would be in Old Testament passages, ways or past finding out... Uh, everything is just beyond our grasp. And I keep asking myself this question. If I'm a good parent, why would I want to keep things away from my children, namely how I am? Uh, with my kids, I love being transparent. I'm not going to say, oh, my ways are past finding out. Damn, you can't see my goodness. I'm going to disclose it to them if I really love them. And so I'm going to put myself, invest myself into them. In fact, I'm going to say that my children are much better than me. I'm going to lift them up. I don't care how many problems they do have. I'm going to cherish them. And when they do wrong, and they will. Sure, you don't give I, up on your children. I don't give up. Right. And when I correct, I correct with patience. I would rather be the one who suffers rather than allowing them to suffer. And so I teach them through methods of kindness and patience and all of that. And there is a corrective manner in that, but it's, it's gentle. It's well, that's a godlike altruistic attitude. Yeah. And that's, that's one of the you know, ways that we kind of are, are made in God's image, I think. We, right. you know, yeah. Like I said, I, 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 human, I, I talk about humans, humans have their problems, but humans are amazing on a daily basis as well. Yeah, but, but when you tell your children, hey, listen, uh, if, if you don't do it my way, I'm going to separate myself from you forever. That's not giving your children any kind of security, is it? Okay, okay you're, you're kind of going back to the salvation aspect. Analogy, right. yeah. In other yeah. words, why, it's why would I tell? To think about. Well, that's, that's one thing I don't understand. You know, I, don't, I can't give you a... Yeah. Uh, you know, I a really great answer you on. so much for saying that, you know, I... I don't know. I, I'm. I got to think about that. That you bring up a good question. I need to wrap my mind around it. Well, kind of. It's kind of a different. It's kind of apples and oranges because you're talking about a human to human relationship where this is God to human relationship where to, where it's, it's salvation and you know you're you're worrying about your children being successful and loving and having a good job and that type of thing where this is God's relationship with us. One of the biggest things is is our salvation and you know the next life and. That type of thing. So it's kind of a different thing. It's but similar but different yeah, but, you know, think, in some yeah. ways. If, if we're going to use the expression, uh, you know, that God is past finding out, if, if we're saying that as kind of an agnostic um, honesty, I can, I can understand it. But if we're using it as a defense for answering some of the problems, I don't like that, you know. So in some sense, I think it depends on how we use such a phrase, such as, you know, his ways are past finding out. Um, 
uh, because I've seen a lot of people try to sweep a lot of things under the rug. You know, how can God do this? How can God? Well, you know, his ways are past finding out. Well, yeah. they're not past finding out. According to the text, it said he did this. So I found it out. You know? <laughs> so I don't see it as a defense. But at the same, in this well, you're in kind the of, same you, sense, but you're kind we of, have... You're kind of taking the, 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 the kind of idea that everything's kind of scientific and we can figure everything out. But yeah, I mean, no, no, and, and we can't. I mean, there's some things here that itself, are just, it's like, this life is itself a, is this mysterious. Is we're, we, you know, we're yeah. on a spinning globe in space and we have just the right perfect gravity that keeps us on Earth. And, you know, when you step on the floor, it feels really solid. But, you know, we're on a spinning ball in space. We're all kind of astronauts. Yeah. On, on this, on this yeah, crazy thing okay. called life anyway. So, so li I know, life is full of mystery and, and things we can't answer. But, but the, the point that I'm making is we're not talking about physics here. We're talking about relationships. We're talking yeah. about whether a child can feel secure with their parent, something that simple. We're not talking about the complicated. We're talking about the simplicity of a child saying, yes, I can always bank on you, Dad. In other words... Um, well, I, tol I, I totally agree with it. I'm just okay. saying you know, I, I, uh, the, I the, 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 the God, you know, son or daughter relationship might be a little different. It, and and by, by nature, I think it is. You know, Jesus said that he would never leave us nor forsake us. I, you know, though, you know that, that's such a powerful statement. You know, the Apostle Paul said there's nothing can, that can separate us from the love of God. He's but for him, to, for him to leave you or forsake you, you have to know him in the first place, don't you? That's mm. not what the text says. He wouldn't no. be if you never if you never knew Jesus, he wouldn't be leaving you. He well, would never leave you. That, the, no, the context has nothing to do with the knowing or believing or anything like that. In fact, in Ephesians chapter four, he states that he's the Father of us all, and he moves through all, and he's actually in all. Some some children never meet their father. <laughs> they well, still have a daddy, though. <laughs> well, uh, you know, I. I, I, I don't know. It's, it's, it's like uh, what the Apostle Paul was saying. You know, love doesn't disconnect itself from other people. And uh, that is if you really love. And I'm assuming people, that, that... You said the word people, though. But, but, but my question is, uh, I, I think that David made the point, you know, even though I make my bed in hell, he's there. Why? Because he loves me. It doesn't matter where I go. I can run as far that way or the other way as I can. But if someone really loves me, they will run after me. And I, I think the point that Jesus is trying to make in the text is that um, I may try to leave him, but he's not going to leave me. And so I think this is why the Apostle Paul makes these statements. Nothing can separate us. A very all-inclusive statement from the love of God. He's not talking directly to believers there. He's talking to atheists and theists alike. And so if it's true that God... You know, nothing can separate us from his love in that kind of context. Would that be wonderful? Well, I would take that to mean um, that once you accept Christ as your Savior, you believe in what he preaches, <gasps> but that, that he loves you, you can mess up but as much as human pl humanly possible and you'll still be okay. Why would it not be fine for a child to say, yes, I'm secure with my father being my father forever. I may be the worst child, but I'm still his child. Why do I need to be separated from being his child? His, his, his physical human does. father, you mean? I'm yeah. talking about it, my, my, my relationship to my it, father. You know, Dr. Jones? Yes, no, no, well, you're, um, you're, you're, I, you're, have, I have two sons from a previous marriage, and uh, they were... They were five and seven when that marriage fell apart, and uh, it was an extremely hostile situation, not between my wife and I, my ex-wife, but between myself and her family. And it ended up that I was estranged from my sons, both of them, for over two decades. And um, I don't think those boys... Um, were without a father who loved them, but I certainly think they grew up not being loved by their father. Mm, that's a good way to put it, yeah. In the comments, it looks like you have some fans. Um, people are really liking on Robert because you seem very sincere, and that's the way I, I'm feeling it too. I right. mean, very sincere. And so we, we'd love to have you back to talk to us again. Well, you after, you, after you review, review my interview, if you uh, found me intelligent to, to uh, 
invite me back to humbly express my views, I'd be, I'd be honored. <laughs> but I, I just want to say that, that sure. I think I totally agree on the human, you know, like your children never giving up on them. I think you're maybe mistakenly think, thinking that, that because uh, it appears that sometimes God um, has to take actions in terms of your salvation that it's different, but I, I, I totally agree that if you have a child, you never give up on them. I, I just want to make that clear. Okay, so in, in you know, in, human to human, you know, oh, if you have okay. a child, don't, like, don't ever give up on your children. It, I totally agree on that. Okay, so it's just, it's, it's just the, the the God to human he, child he, relationship he is just it's just different and more complex. Oh, and I'm not sure yeah. I understand it, and I'm okay. sure I don't understand it either. <laughs> okay, but but you know, there is the question uh, that is of quote unquote the Bible. Did God speak to us in anthropomorphic terms, terms in which we can understand, or is he trying to stay at a distance? In other words, does a, a good father uh, get close or stay at a distance? But see, when you say the word father, you, you automatically think in human terms, though. And, well, and what did, I'm saying is, is, is father, God, okay. God the Father is a, okay. a different relationship. But, but in Christianity, is there anything in Christian manuscripts at all that indicates that he's not speaking anthropomorphically. Well, that's th that's that's a question of that's a that's a question. Yeah. You know, so is he, he or not? If he is always speaking anthropomorphically, and he is, I can guarantee you that he is. Why would we assume that we would want to take it into a level of saying? Well, well we I, I don't can't. think he always does though, because because he describes how how human beings should, should interact, and he also describes his relationship with human beings. You know, so that there are, there are two different situations, I think. I, I, I don't see the distance between God and humanity as you do. And I, I okay. understand that Christianity does place God way up here and human beings way down here. I realize that. And that's one of the reasons that I walked away from Christianity because it ignores uh, the manuscript evidence. But I think that when you look at the manuscript evidence, I, I don't think there is a distance between God and humanity. I think that distance was erased I think by... There has to be some distance. No, no, no. I, I think that... <laughs> Otherwise, we'd all, you know, we'd all be gods, I mean. Uh, I, I think that we're a lot closer. That's what we mean by distance here, too. You know, right, what do we exactly. mean by distance? Exactly. I, mean, I would like I for you to come universes. back and, and do a show with us because you're really honest about things and yeah, you're willing like to say, wow, let's look at it this way and that way. Would you come back? Well, I, I definitely don't want to come off as a Mr. Know-it-all because I don't... I don't there's a lot of things I don't know, and, and uh, I have as many questions as I, I don't know, everyone else does. So. You're, but you're, I, I'd be honored to come back. Okay. Yeah. You're That's coming right. back. I mean, you're coming off as a wonderful person, and uh, we love you very much, and thank you for being on our show. Absolutely. Well, thanks for having me. Oh, yeah. yeah. Certainly. It was wonderful. Bob, you have a good one this evening, and we will see you in the meeting in the morning. Sounds awesome. And is, is Greg gone yet? Greg is. I, I think he left, left the, the building. building or the planet. <laughs> you know, he's the great one. Robert, really nice to meet you. You too. It was, it was great uh, interacting good with Good conversation. You. Yeah. I'll see you guys in the morning. Okay. All right. Take care. Thanks for watching, people. Yep. Good night. You did good.